this way. <laughs> Back to the clinic. That's right. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Thank you to being, uh, for being part again from this nice uh, symposium. So diagnosis and differential diagnosis on hip disease in young adults is a very big topic. Patient coming in in interior clinic, uh, claiming that he has hip pain, we have so many factors they could influence groin or hip pain. Extra-articular, as you can see here, but also articular factors that influence this pain. So it may be something really in the hip, but it may be also something outside the hip joint. So what we are doing, I think to get a decent way to get a good diagnosis, we have to go uh, several steps in doing this diagnosis. The first one for us is the patient history. So we have to know if there is a trauma or no, not a trauma. If there was something in the childhood, late onset of walking and so on, uh, display, uh, diagnosis of dysplasia, or what level of sports are they uh, doing. Location of pain. When you ask the patient, where is your hip, you will be surprised how often they claim that the hip is in the trochanteric region, up in the pelvis some, somewhere, and not really in the anatomic location. So you have to know what he thinks is his hip, and where is it, and you have to know what is the quality of discomfort. Is it stabbing? Is it blocking? Is it uh, a pain that is always there? Is it just uh, with some uh, movements coming and so on? So it will lead you in direction of your diagnosis. Then we have the symptoms. We have to ask for the symptoms. They may be a limited mobility, but you, have, you can also have the contrast, you have a hypermobility, and they will tell you, I'm not so mobile as the other ones in my sports club, or the other ones tell you I'm very, very uh, mobile. Intermittent groin pain, when does it happen? Does it happen when you are doing sports? Is it when you are sitting more? Have you a painful uh, hip flexion? Groin pain during sport activities or after sports activities? Have you painful adductors without any or with a traumatic event? And then you have the triggers. What is leading to the pain? Activities with rotation in your hip, prolonged hip flexion sitting in your car, rising from a seating position. The patient will tell you, going up out of a relaxed position, I can't stand on my hip. It is so painful and it's blocked. So the hip seems to be blocking. Symptoms entering and exiting a car. Sexual intercourse may be a painful thing. Putting on shoes, socks, stockings, and walking. Sports activities, no question about that. So the combination of patient history Symptoms and triggers leads to the diagnosis with which has to stand the test uh, of the physical exam. So what are the pathologic findings we can have during the physical exam? We can have excessive mobility, but we can also have limited mobility, especially in internal rotation. Painful flexion and or internal rotation when we do our exam on our patient. Trendelenburg guide, gate or sign. We, I have to admit, are no more using the Trendelenburg sign because it's not very uh, reliable. So we are much more looking for the abductor weakness. When we position the patient, we do it in a completely extended, extended uh, hip. We flex the knee to about 30 to 45 degrees and make uh, um, good internal rotation in a way that your trochanteric, your, your trochanter is in the highest position. And then we ask the patient to withstand our force on the lower leg and you will see that there is a big difference sometimes between one and the other leg and with experience you will see what is really a weak abductor. Sometimes even young patients are not able to 
keep this position for five, 10 seconds. So you can't have the patient in this position. That means the abductors are very weak. The impingement sign, for me, it's a really dynamic test. It's not something that has been described, flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. When you do this and you uh, slide your hip over the anterior uh, pelvic uh, acetabular rim, everybody will be painful. So you have to do it dynamically. So you use the, the weight of the leg and you, you uh, bring it in contact to the anterior rim, and if this is painful and the patient tells you that this is the typical pain for him or for her, then it's a positive impingement sign. So typically, the, the, the pain should be, as it is shown here, in a C sign, so that means it is something intraarticular. If the patient shows you, when you ask him where is the pain, if he shows you into the trochanteric region, then it may be just a bursitis. If the patient shows you into the groin, it may be a problem with the psoas or with the AD ductors. So this may not be an articular problem. Apprehension sign, I just tested in patients with hypermobility. In a patient that, who has already limited mobility, it doesn't make sense because you are not um, uncovering the femoral head when you go in this position. Tractus loading tests to, uh, um, to see if there is a bursitis and to reproduce the typical pain when the patient walks the stairs or when he is lying, uh, laying on the side. Coxasaltans, iliotibial band, the same, bursitis trochanterica, very often correlated with abductor weakness. When you reinforce the abductors, these symptoms will disappear. A very important sign is also the iliopsoa snapping. So the patient tells you, when he comes into clinic, what I already said, that when he is getting up out of a relaxed position, sitting, that he has some blocking. It's not possible at the moment to stand on the leg. They have to make some movement. They tell you that sometimes there is a clunk and then, it's, then the, the, the hip is again free and everybody thinks it's uh, blocking in the joint. It's the iliopsoas probably that is kept over the um, uh, capsule or the pectineal eminence. And uh, this, I see very often, patients have been operated for those signs and they don't improve after, for example, a hip arthroscopy because they have still the psoas snapping. You can also test the psoas when you go in full flexion of the knee and you see that, that uh, your pelvis is lifting, then you know that your uh, psoas may be short and there is more pressure of the psoas in, uh, uh, onto um, the, uh, the pubic ramus. One other thing that may be making your diagnosis more difficult is that the same nerves that um, um, are responsible for the musculature around a joint are also uh, responsible for innervation of the joint. So we know that some trigger points, for example, for a psoas may really uh, see, uh, make an impression that there is a joint problem because the pain is really in the groin, but you have also, um, um, you have also signs in other areas of the body and you have to look for those. Sometimes in order to, dis, uh, make the dis, uh, to distinguish between an intraarticular and, the, and just a periarticular uh, problem, you can do a diagnostic infiltration of the joint. As I already said, abductor weakness, adductor hypertonus is something that goes along uh, together, and it's a very often, especially in young patients, it's 
very often uh, misinterpreted as um, an articular problem. I can tell you that at least 50% of my patients sent to our clinic for impingement have no impingement, but they have a muscular disbalance. And when you improve the abductors, the uh, hypertonus of the adductors will disappear and the patient is absolutely pain-free. So, there is a high risk that some patients are overdiagnosed, for example, for impingement. Short muscles, tendinitis is the same. Young soccer players in uh, Switzerland, they often show up with a problem in the groin, and it is a tendinitis of the rectus femoris on the uh, iliac spine, and when you stretch the muscle in a decent way, these symptoms disappear, and the articulation is absolutely pain-free. So what is important? Groin pain is not equal to an intraarticular problem. We have to try to distinguish between intraarticular and extraarticular pain. Pain which is provoked during the exam must be typical for the patient. When you have a, a, a pain, when you de do the exam and the patient says, oh, that's not something I know, then forget it, then it's your problem with your exam. And if there is an MRI uh, uh, and the clinical exam don't correspond, so go for the clinic. Some little words to x-rays. The x-ray is a shadow of what we have in nature, and it may be distorted. And we have to really realize, and I liked the talk of uh, Brian Kelly, looking for the two parts of the joint. Very often we are just looking, inclination of the pelvis, but we are not looking at the femur, what the femur does. It's very important to understand that we have to look and combine the two parts of the joint. And we have to have standardized x-rays, we typically do the pelvis, the cross table view, the pelvis in a uh, decent position, then the cross table view, as we do it here, as you can see on this scheme, then the false profile view to see the anterior coverage, and we do very frequently, and all our patients with uh, suspicion of impingement, we do a Dun Ripstein Miller view in order to see on the other plane and the second plane how the really the anterior, the anterior part of the femur may look. It's very important to see in a si simple way what the torsion of your proximal femur is. This is a uh, young patient, no anti-torsion uh, anti at all, and the other one has a very high anti-torsion. So the behavior of those two hips will be completely different. We can then go and all measure all those different uh, measurements, anterior coverage, acetabular index, uh, lateral coverage, but something I would like that you are looking also to is the teardrop figure, which tells you how much force you have between the femoral head or the forming force into the joint in a protrusio or in a, in a dysplasia. Iliacia line, once again, tells you something on, deep, on a deep socket and how deep your socket is. Coxa profunda and acetabuli. Once again, very important is the orientation of the acetabulum. But here we can have a retroversion and we can have an antiversion. But retroversion doesn't mean that this patient has a real problem just on the, on the uh, acetabular side. We have to look at the femoral side too. And in this patient, I can tell you, even she had a crossing side, her problem was a posterior superior impingement uh, made out of the um, femur with a high antitorsion. We have also to understand that sometimes we have just uh, dysplasia on the femoral side and not so much important on 
the acetabular side. When we go to MRI, we have to have decent MRIs with a coil that gives us the information leading to um, understand what's going on, what we then really see intraoperatively. But we have also to be careful. In about 60, up to 60% in the literature, in uh, people, they have no symptoms at all. We have changes in the labrum. So it doesn't mean a little change in the labrum that that is really the problem of the patient. We don't see pain in our MRIs. We have to be sure that this is really the problem we are looking for. So X-rays should be standardized. Findings have to be interpreted with care. And keep in mind that the hip uh, has two parts. A pathologic finding on one side may be compensated, completely compensated, or aggravated by the other joint part. Thank you very much.